It's not often that we look at classic American doubles here, mostly because we live in the country where the best cyber sides were and quite possibly are still created. However, this one is definitely worthy of note. This is an Ithaca. Come have a look. So before we start, I'm going to say that I didn't know a huge amount about Ithaca doubles up until the point where this gun found its way into my hands, because to be honest, I just wasn't that interested. However, now having got this, I've been on a mildly deep dive and I would say that I know more than I ever did. And I probably care a little bit more than I ever did, which is the interesting thing in life that these okay, opportunities come along. So this particular gun is the model Crass. Frederick Crass of, I might be pronouncing that wrong, Frederick Crass of Ithaca came up with this design and here it is. It was produced, I believe, from 1988 to about 1903. An ejector model did come in in about 1898, quite probably, 1898. This is a non-ejector Damascus model. This particular one was made in 1896. Isn't it a sweetie? They did seven different qualities. Seven different qualities? Seven different qualities. I believe there was a completely bland one all the way through up to a quality seven. Anything above a quality four is exceedingly rare. This is a quality four. So let's start probably at the back because that's logical. It has a non-original, non-Ithaca pad, the anti-flinch recoil pad, and somebody's changed the pitch at some point. Who knows what, when that happened, but you know, I like seeing things like that. It means that someone cared enough about this gun to have it fitted so they shot better with it. And not, nothing's been done to the wood subsequently, I wouldn't have thought, since it was made. I mean, you can still you can feel the ridges of the wood where it's swollen, got hard and shrunk over the years. It's got lots of marks. It's got a lovely little escutcheon in the bottom there that the wood has shrunken around, and yet nobody put their initials in, which is kind of sad. So I was about to say that it's this pistol grip and checkering pattern that give away that it's American, but actually this escutcheon is a really uncommon thing to see on a British gun. So that's probably the first giveaway I should have said that it is not of English origin and the difference in fashion change, but it's really here. And so the grip is, you know, to be seen on a live pigeon gun quite regularly in the UK. And to be fair, the rib kind of gives away that it could have been similar, but I haven't got a basis for comparison. But this checkering is very much a American style. It's these fleur-de-lis sort of inlets and the inside bordering and the skip edging, that kind of thing. It's very not British. And it's very interesting, and I'm sure at this juncture there will be an American comment in the conversation saying, yeah, when we kicked you out, that there would have been at some point at a complete divergence, seeing as I have seen in styles between the British and American styles, seeing as I have seen this style of checkering on antique British guns. There you go. I just find that interesting that at some point we decided that this was naff, a bit like skinny jeans, and that the Americans thought that this was very fashionable. I find it amusing also that they nicknamed or named, named the model the crass. Amusing in some way. Anyway, let's flip it over and have a look on top here. You have a parallel safety tank and a really nice petite little safety, really deeply carved. And again, a very interesting style, very interesting style. In fact, the whole of this gun is quite nice in a very different way. You know, if you were comparing it to a uh, Steam Grant or a Holland or a Purdy or a Woodward, you'd, you know, I would say it was just very different. It probably doesn't hold up, but it is very different. And in such, you don't feel like it's a crap emulation, like a lot of cheaper English guns and a uh, multitude of Spanish guns over the years. But from the bordering to the ways these, the fences kind of stick out the side and these sort of top parts here kind of just swoop down into the stock there. And you've actually got a really nice, beautiful line. It is a very interesting gun. The beading around the sides there is really quite pleasant. This is not a bolstered gun, although that really matters, but I believe the, the third type of crass action was bolstered, meaning you have sort of the, the side pieces here that come out. Actually, I think they don't look great, whereas on this gun with its flat sides, it looks really nice. You have a million screws, 
and these operate in a fairly interesting fashion that I will go into in a separate members video because I'd like to go inside this and I'd like to share that with the members. So go and check that out in probably next week, to be fair, in the members section. You have another strange thing is that actually, and it's just an observation that the triggers are actually much more squat than most English guns. And I've just been playing with a couple downstairs comparing this with it. And actually the triggers are, it's only about an eighth of an inch here, but it's that rear trigger that is just more squat and tightly curved than a, three good examples of British guns. Engraving wise, it's very pleasant. You have the twi twisted rope border. You have the acanthus scroll at the back and you have the little game scene of a shaggy haired pointing dog pointing at a bird. You have a rabbity looking thing on the bottom. You have what is most likely, I said a duck, it's probably more likely a woodcock actually looking at it. It's not quite anything ducky about it with a short hair pointer behind it and the hills, it's very pleasant. And again, a lot of accounts across the It's actually a really good looking gun. Like it stands up in the modern world a lot more than a lot of other things. And on the trigger guard here, I'm looking forward to somebody telling me what this is because it's not immediately recognizable as an animal. Um, a crested bird with a very long, thick tail. I don't know what that is. Um, it's not a British bird, that's what I'm sure. The checkering itself, actually, in fact, the whole, everything about this gun is secretly quite pleasant. It's just, it takes your head a little while to get around all of that input fashion into your head that this is not one of them. The checkering on the forehand is interesting as well. You have the scallop edging. Um, sorry, uh, hit the camera in my head. And it's just an interesting gun. The horn tip is nice. The way the forehand hooks on with that spring is, to be honest, I think it's a bit outdated for an 1896 gun, but you know, I'm sure they have damn good reason to be putting it in there. Interesting, strange little screw in there. No idea what that does. I can't wait to take that out. And if you flip it over, we'll have a quick look at the rib before we look at the barrels, which are quite exciting. It is a tapered rib from very fat to very thin. Again, my presumption is it's a live pigeon gun. It's got live pigeon guns written all over it. But not being a fair with these things, that is just a presumption. That could just be what all crasses in a grade four look like, but they don't because I've looked at the multiple pictures trying to research this and it's clear that they change their models every couple of years. A little bit like a lot of gun companies now, they just change the engraving a little bit, just so that in a hundred years time when people are looking back, they go, why would they do that? Well, probably the same reason they do it now, to sell more guns. Um, and fashions do change anyway. So they made a few of these. I think they range from the 7,000 serial number up to about a 50,000 serial number. So you can do the maths on that. There is plenty of them. They did them in a 10, a 12, and a 16. The 16s are inherently way more valuable because they made less. And I would have thought the 10s will probably sit in the same boat. Stop talking about that a sec. Look at this Damascus. For me, this is a very interesting thing. This Damascus is unlike anything that you'll see very commonly in Britain at all. It's more of a pattern well of it. You've got the little crosses mixed into the circle. It's a very interesting style of Damascus steel. There you go. Being an American gun, this gun is not proofed. However, I have it on good authority that they really are designed for like about 7,000 PSI. They really are not designed for modern cartridges at all. Um, the barrels or the actions, in fact. Whereas a lot of British black powder guns, you can get away with putting nitro through or they will pass nitro through, especially with the Damascus. These guns really do not like modern cartridges. So when you're doing it, you need to be very conscientious about using low pressure cartridges if shooting one of these. I have it on very good authority, at least. And given that most modern cartridges, certainly in America anyway, are way in excess of sort of 11,000, that's a lot. You know, 12, 13, 14,000 PSI three barrels will not be healthy for them, at least but they are a very beautiful and interesting style of Damascus. So there you go. Um, style over substance? No, probably not when it was made, it was, it was bloody good. And apparently it's not even a Damascus, it goes for that, it goes for the fluid steel as well. So there you go. It is an interesting gun from the way that it cocks to everything else, this little hook here, and I, well, I look forward to sharing that with the members at some point, just where, you know, here it's either a side lock of a variety or it's a box lock Anton and Dealey of a variety and with fairly limited change. Uh, and I say that with, fairly, with a very few exceptions to that. It's our single trigger systems and ejector systems that change a lot more. This is 
very much unlike anything that I've seen re recently or regularly. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. There are multiple Ithaca models of which this was one of the earliest ones. Uh, there was the new Ithaca gun, which I think would have been similar to this, similar era, and there was a hammer variant. There was this, the Crass. There was the Lewis, the Minier, and the Flues. Flues. Um, the Flues is the more common one. I think they made like nearly a quarter of a million of them. And they came in multiple grades as well. And they look a little bit the same, but not the same because they don't have screws. In fact, they all look fairly similar because why would you change the style that much? What is interesting about the Flues is the internals are, are different again, but to be honest, this is different enough for me, so I'm all set. There you go, an American double. What do we make of it? Uh, apart from the fact that it is heavy, but that could also be just the fact that it's a 30 inch gun and where it's not proofed, I haven't even measured the barrel thickness on it, but being an American gun, generally their barrel thicknesses are a little bit more than ours. It balances, I mean the hinge is miles forward and it still balances in front of the hinge. It is a big lump of a gun. Has it got any proof stamps on there? Why don't Americans proof their guns? It's the stupidest thing. I mean, it's not stupid. That's nasty. It's just a really nice way of being able to open a gun up and go, oh, that's what it was built for. Anyway, there you go. The Ithaca Crass. Two more observations. Apart from the weight and the fact that it actually handles all right, is that these guns were made with about a 15, a 14 and a quarter inch stock. So they're actually a little bit longer than a lot of guns back in the day. And they actually had a factory spec of length, which is interesting. And secondly is look at the cast on this gun. I mean, it's probably hard to tell, but if I said that gun had like an almost a full inch of cast, that's insane. But that does mean for a short gun, it actually comes up all right. This gun is destined to be go off to be proofed. Mostly because I'd like to shoot it. Secondly, because I don't mind blowing it up. And thirdly, because, well, it's completely worthless without that. There you have it, the Ithaca Crass. <sighs> Insert some pun about it not being crass after all. Guys, take care. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and well, members, I'll see you for a strip down.